And a very good day and welcome to another Bible study from Caris Dumfries. Yes, today we continue our studies in 2 Peter chapter 1 and we come to that amazing verse that says that we come to share in the divine nature. Isn't that an amazing thought that we come to be participators, partakers of the divine nature, the very nature of God himself. But don't take my word for it. Let's read it from the scriptures itself. Here we are in 2 Peter chapter 1. His exceedingly great and precious promises have been given to us that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Isn't there it is. Yeah. It is tremendous indeed that we should be partakers of the very nature of God himself. I mean, we are new creations. That makes sense, doesn't it, Jasmine? It does, because these great and precious promises are like Acts 2.21. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then, not just saved and left to our own devices, Andrew, but partakers, sharers of his divine nature. Imagine that. And it's like 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we are new creations in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a, new, a brand new creation and the old has passed away, look, behold, the new has come. So, in fact, that means we don't have a sinful nature anymore that drives us to do these things that, that corrupt us. Isn't that great? That's yes, really good it, news. It actually says, doesn't it, the old has gone. Couldn't mm -hmm. be clearer than that, is it? The mm -hmm. old nature has gone. Behold, we've got a new nature. And Peter's telling us that's the very nature of God himself. Everything God is, is inside of us. That's an amazing, isn't it? His love, his power, his joy, his faithfulness, his godliness. Doesn't mean that we're God. Don't misunderstand this. We're not God, but we have his nature within us. What are some of the implications of that, Jasmine? Well, the... The one that I think that Peter's pointing out is we don't have to respond anymore to temptation because, as we said, this old heart of stone has been taken out. So it was prophesied, you know, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, that the old heart of stone would be taken out of us and we'd have a new heart, a heart that loves God and a heart that responds to him. And that's exactly what's happened when Jesus died on the cross. He just paid the penalty for our sin. All those uh, requirements that were against us, legal requirements, were annulled and we have been ushered into the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? And so James 1.13 actually says that if we are tempted, it's not from God as well. That's even better news. It's our, the residue, you know, of our older, old life. Our flesh can be tempted. But now, as you say, we have God's nature and not the sinful nature. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from that old law of sin and death. Wow. Well, that, that is a wow indeed, isn't it? I mean, and it's something to get our head around, something for us to truly grasp as, as fact, divine truth that can impact the way that we live. I mean, if we think that we have all these divine attributes in us, as Peter has earlier said, and we've looked at it in previous weeks, his divine power has given us everything we need for life everything we need for life and godliness hey? sharing in the nature of god himself it, it's it's a really amazing thought isn't it i mean because he says that we have escaped the corruption that is in the world now we all know that the world is corrupt and I think he's wanting to tell us that it is corrupting, like it's corrosive. 
that if we stay in the world, it's as though we're staying in a, a vat of acid that will eat away at us and destroy us and corrode us and mm, horrible things to us. Eh? That's bad. <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? Whereas Colossians 1.13 says that we have been delivered. God has delivered us or transferred us from the kingdom of darkness and conveyed us, transferred us into the kingdom of light. So we're no longer in the dark where it's all damp and, and gloomy and nothing grows apart from the slime. <laughs> but we've been transferred into his radiant light, his kingdom of light, where his light reigns and we just grow and flourish and blossom as we're intended to do. But so that, that is great, isn't it, that we've been brought into the light. I think, there's some, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's something about this corrosion as well, because he's been talking about our faith being precious. Remember back in chapter, in verse one, chapter one, verse one, he talks about us having like precious faith. Underline that word precious. We've looked at it in weeks past. It, it's valuable. It, it can't be destroyed. It's like gold. And then in verse 4, he says we have precious promises. I think the two are, are linked because we know that our faith comes through hearing the word of God, the word of Christ. And if those promises of God are precious, then our faith is going to be precious as well. Does that make sense? Do you, do you get what I'm saying there? Absolutely. I mean, everything that comes from God is like incorruptible. We have been born again with, by an incorruptible seed. It's heavenly. It hasn't been defiled by the earth. Everything that comes from the earth is corruptible, isn't it, Andrew? It yeah, is. We're dust. We're going to return to dust. But it's the precious spirit that's inside us that is actually, you know, eternal. And it's our faith through these precious promises, the word of God, which is the incorruptible seed that is actually um, in engaging with us and, in, and we are in engaging with it. And, and this is what's bearing fruit to God, isn't it? This is what, where this faith is, is, is coming from. And what makes it so, so precious and solid, it, it's refined like gold. But you know, Peter in one, his first letter, 1 Peter says that even gold perishes. Mm -hmm. that, that's an amazing thought, isn't it? Because ordinarily we know silver perishes. If people go in the sea with a, a silver ring on it, it gets tarnished, doesn't it? But it, if we go in the sea with our, our wedding ring on, it, it might get a bit cleaner than it is, but it doesn't <laughs> sort of corrode uh, the, uh, the gold. And yet Peter says even gold tested it in fire, pure as it is, perishes. But our faith, God's promises, and our inheritance never fade or spoil or perish. Let's get them in the right order. They never perish, spoil, or, or fade. I, I looked it up in some other versions as well. Let me see if I can find them. Um, he says, that it's precious like faith and so it which is incorruptible how about that incorruptible indestructible <laughs> captain scarlet we used to say indestructible <laughs> isn't it <laughs> but this is incorruptible nothing can stain or diminish it can, and it can't wither uh, like the flowers in, in, in the heat our inheritance our faith God's promises are, are pure like that. And so you see the contrast that in the, in the world, we of ourselves would be subject to, to corrosion, to corruption. But now that we're in the kingdom of light, even though that light is an intense light and a purifying light, it won't destroy us. Eh? And, and we won't fade or, or wither or spoil 
or perish. In the world we will, if we stay there, we will perish <laughs> like a worn out uh, hot water bottle that just leaks <laughs> all over everywhere. We, we won't spoil, eh? That's right, yeah. and, and that gives us great confidence, doesn't it? And not confidence in ourselves, but confidence in God, his divine nature, those exceedingly great and precious promises, and that he's made, gave us, given us that deposit of faith, the faith of Christ that we spoke of in earlier programs. So we have great confidence that we don't have to live like everybody else, that we don't have to go with the flow, you know, downstream. But <laughs> oh, I remember one of our friends said that, you know, if you're riding a bicycle and you're going and you're stopped pedaling, you're probably going downhill. So <laughs> we just keep pedaling that pedal of faith every day and stay stay in that place where we know we are in relationship with God and his, in his word. And, and yes, that may take a little effort, but it's not dead works, religious works, trying to please God for, to make us acceptable to him. It's actually uh, what they call them, the rhythms of grace. It's actually staying in, in our place of faith and, and receiving the, uh, the precious and very great promises that we believe in. Indeed, indeed, because uh, you talk about an, an effort, but we're quick to say that this isn't our effort. It's not by might nor by power, but by God's spirit. He enables us, you know. Paul talks about striving with the strength that God mightily supplies. I mean, that, that is something, isn't it? That he gives us the capacity to keep pedaling. <laughs> to keep right. to Even to pedal uphill. Because if you don't go backwards down the hill, you're falling off the bike, hey? But he keep, gives us the capacity, the power, the strength, the ability to keep pedaling even when we're up against it. And of course, this is the context in which uh, Paul, uh, Peter, it, is speaking. That when times are difficult, when Christians are getting blamed, you can keep on going. You won't perish or spoil or fade. Men might do their worst to you they might persecute you they might even hurt you but they they cannot destroy your spirit and your soul because so we've been redeemed that's right and i've been reading psalm 46 where it says god is our refuge and strength are very present in help in trouble therefore we will not fear you know even though the mountains be moved and in the earth is shaken and everything's going haywire you know it's pretty bad when the earth is shaking and, and the mountains are falling into the sea. But even in those times, which we know from scripture will come one day, and perhaps we may be on the earth when they come. But at the same time, we have confidence in God. And we've said before that his word is more solid than the very ground we stand on. And what confidence we can have that his word will carry us through any difficult situation. Yes, I, that, that is a very good point, Jasmine, because sometimes Christians uh, who believe and take God's word seriously are sort of criticised for not living in the real world. Uh, uh, and we know what they mean in as much as that perhaps they're, they're otherworldly, but in a sense that's the place to be. Yes, we don't deny that there are wars going on in the world today. Yeah. We don't deny that there are Christians being persecuted in the world today, that there are earthquakes of, of significant magnitude going off in, in the world today. We don't deny that, but we take a higher ground by putting our trust in, in Jesus. The wise man built his house upon a rock. Eh? That's right. <laughs> so the, when the storms come, and they do come, and they will come, we can stand firm with our feet on the rock. No Amen. matter what men say, we'll lift his name on high and exalt his word above everything else that's going on around and about us. So we, we don't deny that there are troubles in the world, but we are more than the conquerors through him who loved us. These are amazing promises to encourage ourselves as we watch the news day in and day out and all the bad things that are, are happening in the world. That's we right. are still more than the conquerors. And you know, the truth is that many people, many Christians are actually called into those areas mm. to make a difference. Some of us may not be, we may be observers and intercessors, we may be lifting them to, to God in prayer, 
But, you know, we watched the film Free Burma Rangers, didn't we, the other week? And my goodness, some people are called to the front lines to rescue people in those very situations. And I think, Andrew, we would be amazed if uh, God lifted the curtain and we saw how many people, uh, you know, Christian people in the body of Christ are right there in those places where the, the most trauma and, and trouble are ministering to people quietly, you know, without a lot of, uh, without any media probably uh, coverage. Well, I'm going to say, you said if God uh, lifts the curtain, it's probably if the media put the spotlight on these situations, isn't it? Because one of the things the Free Burma Rangers were doing, that they were going to the front line of hostile environments in Burma, in Iraq, in Syria, and they were taking raw video footage of what was really going on on the ground and they were getting it through the Associated Press and other media to the world's attention and indeed the attention of the United Nations who had no idea what was really going on on the front line and yet here the Christians were uh, eager that the truth be known, eager that help was being, would be brought to those who were still suffering mm. uh, in, in the midst of a civil war. And this is where, you know, the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. This is where the power of God is seen because there are miracles happening, with divine wisdom given, ability to take authority in different situations. And this is where when people are putting their faith on the line, going where God tells us to go, doing what God tells us to do, that, that we experience the power of God, experience the protection of God, and see wonderful things happen. It's exciting, isn't it? It's very exciting. It does take that step of faith, isn't it? And sometimes people think, oh my goodness, I don't want to be on the front line. Wherever your front line might be, there is sort of terrifying situations you don't want to face tomorrow. But as you wait on God's wisdom, knowing that you've got all the resources of heaven on your side and in your inside, <laughs> you can face that. But hey, you do need to take a step in that direction. You do need to, to, to move out. I mean, we, we tell potential students, don't we, that uh, their provision is where God sends them. Uh, we're thinking about Andrew Walmack's teaching uh, about... Uh, a place called there. A place called there because God fed Elijah in that place called there. Uh, he didn't go off with a sack full of food, but the ravens brought him the meat and, and, and the bread where he was sent. Mm -hmm. And as, it, as we step out to where we are sent, we will find that provision in abundance praise right. god for that and so when you know with the word comes the grace doesn't it with the word comes the provision with the word comes in everything we need you know when um, jesus said to the disciples you go to the other side of the lake um in that word in that command was everything they needed to get there and so even though a storm do, raised rose up when on on route they exactly. had everything with them yeah, especially when a storm came on the other side, because they had the word of the Lord, didn't they? And he himself came to make sure that word was fulfilled. They had no problem, really. You know, it's just, we, whenever we meet a new situation, it's just remembering that, letting the Holy Spirit minister the word of God. And in that word is our healing, in that word is our, our wisdom, our provision, everything that we need. And that's really where we need to rely on the word rather than our circumstances around us. Because when something happens to us, perhaps a, a breakdown in a relationship or, or news of a bad health diagnosis, it sort of looms large in, in our vision and it sort of commands all of our attention. And we get sucked in to, to the pain of that situation. It's then that we need to take that step of faith and remember that inside of us are all the resources to be able to cope with this situation. See, sometimes people misunderstand Paul's thorn in the flesh and they think that God didn't do anything about this thorn that was impacting him. But listen, God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient 
for you. My grace is all you need in this situation to be able to cope with this situation. In a sense, he's saying, what more do you want me to do for you? Now, we don't say that in a condemning way, but just to drive it home that he has provided his grace for you to cope with everything that's thrown your way today, tomorrow, next month, next year, (laughs) the future ahead of you. His grace is enough, more than we ever need, as that beautiful Hillsong song says. Yeah, that's really great. Good. I suppose we better get back on track, Andrew. We better get back. (laughs) (laughs) We're 20 minutes off piece, but that was fun, wasn't it? (laughs) It was, it was, it was. Let's read 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 7. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. What a great list. What a great list. But this should raise in you a question. Uh, And perhaps some of our viewers are saying, wait a minute, I thought you've been laboring the fact that we've already got everything we need for life and godliness. In fact, Peter says it himself. So what's he talking about adding if I've already got it? How can you add if we've already got it? Well, I kind of think of it more like a rewiring exercise, you know, because Our brains, even though we have a a new spirit, we have old ways of thinking. And I think we have to add in to our our ways of understanding these these new concepts that we are new uh, in Christ, that we have all things, we are complete in him. And so that that takes out the old uh, and puts in the new. And that's an addition to our understanding. And with our understanding, then if we act on it, then we'll actually be kind of putting motion to our boat, I think. So since we're Christians, we can live like a Christian and we can be wholehearted about it. Amen. I I like that. I like that. I I came across a, a commentary that told me something that I didn't know about this word, add. It said that Peter has borrowed it from the ancient um, Greek dances. You know, Greek dances are the the big community dances, the circle dances where they all join hands and celebrate the fact that they're one community. And when somebody joins that circle, they are adding to it. Right. Right, adding to the circle, adding to the sense of community, adding to the sense of wholeness. Yeah. Now, now because they're already there waiting to join in, they in the wings, if, if you like, or on, on the sidelines. Yeah. Um, but then they are brought into the action. They're brought into the dance. They're brought into play uh, as, as required. I like that very much because it is true that in our spirit we have everything we need for life and godliness. Sounding a bit like a broken record. (laughs) (laughs) But it's a truth, it's a good positive confession. So that we can, when we need it, bring that love into play. So that it joins the dance, if you like. When we need peace when we're faced with all these wars and troubles going on in the world, we can bring in that peace to play. It's part of the dance, part of what we've already been given. But as you rightly said, we we need to live in the good of that. We need to bring it into play so that it becomes part of the dance of our life to be a bit corny, (laughs) to be a bit corny. That's lovely. (laughs) You can picture the whole thing, can't you? It's great. Like, celebration a great celebration because these ancient greek dances well as in modern greek dances have great cultural significance uh it is a great sense of community as i said of family of rejoicing of jubilation of, of life and you can see all of those godly virtues that he mentions there what is it faith 
goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance and godliness, mutual affection and, and, and love, agape love or agape for our American friends. Agape, the uh, Greek would say, I think. That wholeness all summed up in that word love, being brought into play. And do you know, Paul, Peter, uh, Peter has drawn on, borrowed another word from ancient Greek dances, and it comes later when he's talking about being granted a, a grand entrance or an entrance in abundance. Because he said, if all these things are yours, um, what did he say? And abound. And abound. If all these things are yours and abound, and entrance will be given to you an abundant entrance you think what on earth i've read that before and said what on earth is an abundant entrance hmm? and th this commentator gave the clue he said it's like in a play the the grand entrance or more the the finale where everybody together uh, comes uh, uh, at the grand finale. Here I am and all these virtues, the, pi the pi 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 person that I'm supposed to be. And it's almost as though you can take a bow. Here I am and the children you have given me, Lord. Here I am and the virtues that you've given me to bring into this play. What a grand celebration it is, a grand entrance hey and all the audience is applauding in rapturous applause because you are complete the circle is complete the circle is just as it it's supposed to be with all those virtues playing their part at, at the right time and so wow what a, a celebration there is and he said that's what it's going to be like when we get uh, to heaven all of these virtues playing their part coming with us and that we're not there like a big draggled old soul standing on our own who are saying thank goodness that's over but we come with jubilation because all of his life and godliness has enabled us to triumph uh, and to conquer through wow. his love well, sharing that, Andrew, you certainly don't look like a poor old bedraggled <laughs> soul. <laughs> that was amazing. So really, I guess what Peter and what we've been talking about is that big word, sanctification. And the whole process, it's a lifelong process, but it doesn't have to be a hard, sad process. It's a joyful thing when, when we're met with you know, an adverse circumstance, we add in, here comes joy, here comes wisdom. Here comes knowledge, you know, and virtue and self-control to go with it. It's a joyful process. But, you know, our pastor had a really good way of describing sanctification yesterday. And he said, it, he said it's the gradual, lifelong path of becoming more like Jesus on a daily basis. I Say that, that again. Say it again. Okay. The gradual, lifelong path of becoming more like Jesus on a daily basis. Yes, it is gradual. Yes, it is lifelong. Yes, it is a daily basis. But look at the result. We're becoming more like Jesus, less of us, more of him. So it's worth allowing all the old to be shed, to just, to just, just lose it. Uh, while we're putting on Christ, we're gaining Christ. Because when we see him, we shall be like him. Isn't that amazing? In Colossians, when Christ, who is our life, appears we shall also, or you will also appear with him in glory. And down there in verse 5 of Colossians, Paul's saying much the same as Peter, put to death the earthly stuff. It, it didn't get you anywhere in the first place. It's not worth anything. It's corrupt. But put on Christ-like qualities, which come from heaven, and that's what take us up to heaven. And in Philippians, I, I love um, what Paul said again, not that I've already attained it, I'm already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So there's that determination to leave behind the old life with its old ways and take hold of our new life in Christ. And what uh, does Peter say in 2 Peter 1, 8, 10, Andrew? What does he say indeed? So he says, for if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful. 
you'll be producing <laughs> what you're supposed to be producing. I, I love that where Jesus says, I have called and appointed you. I've chosen and appointed you to bear fruit and fruit that will abide. Fruit that abides is fruit that doesn't perish or go off. Have you ever yeah. thought of that? Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to keep it in the fridge. You can enjoy it. Um, but that's what we're intended to do. And we won't be barren or unfruitful. We will produce that fruit as we abide in him. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be fruitful in our relationship with him. Because we all know that word mean, knowledge means relationship. For he who lacks these things, or those who haven't brought those virtue into play, is short-sighted. <laughs> in fact, they don't see that they're standing in front of them or they're inside of them ready to be brought into play, even to blindness. Eh? It is. You can be blind to the fact that you've got all these good things in inside of you. Sometimes people haven't told us, and so it's just sort of simple I ignorance, to be as blunt as that. Sometimes we've been told it but don't believe it. Sometimes circumstances around us uh, might blind us because they're shouting so, so in our face uh, that we're not uh, open to the fact that Paul prays that our eyes might be open to the spiritual realities. <laughs> and people who lack these things have forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. In other words, they, they're wanting to go back to the acid uh, vat, uh, that <laughs> uh, tank where it's all corruption and corrosion, whereas they can live in the light and in the freedom of the light of Christ. Because the light of Christ has come into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. But he says to us, let your light shine. In other words, let everything that is in your spirit radiate through your soul and through your body and have an impact on your family, on your place of work, your school, your everyday environment, at the shops, at the bus stop, wherever you are, let your light shine for him. So I think that's probably bringing us to a nice conclusion mm -hmm. for today, Jasmine. Perhaps uh, we'll say bye-bye for now and join us again next week as we continue our studies through uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. And Jasmine will read the numbers for us if you'd like prayer or, or help. Or even if you're thinking about uh, becoming a student at Caris Bible College, uh, you can ring these numbers and people will direct you in the way to go. But for now, we'll say bye-bye as Jasmine reads the numbers for us this week. Yes. Bye for now. And if you're outside the UK, you can call the helpline in the USA at 719-635-1111. From the UK, it's 01922-473300.